before I do that, I'd like to ask Matthew to raise his right hand. And repeat after me, I solemnly affirm. I solemnly affirm. That I will faithfully correct. That I will faithfully correct. All quantum errors. All quantum errors. Real or imagined. Real or imagined. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The quantum computer. The quantum computer. Congratulations. Thank you. By the authority vested in me. I bestow upon you the best paper award. And our next speaker will be Matt Reed, three qubit quantum error correction with superconducting qubits, or circuits. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as mentioned, I'm, I'm Matt Reed. I'm a grad student in Rob Sholkoff's lab at, at Yale University. And I'm going to be talking to you about our recent results uh, demonstrating the three qubit code in our superconducting circuit. So the general outline of my talk, I thought I'd introduce uh, superconducting qubits generally because this is maybe not an audience super familiar with them. Uh, then talk about how we can do two qubit gates in two very different ways, both uh, through an adiabatic interaction and a sudden interaction. Uh, we can use these, these gates to make interesting states like GHC states. Uh, and as I'm sure everyone knows, that GHC states are very interesting because you can base the three qubit code on them. Uh, then we'll talk about how we can implement an efficiency to uh, efficient Toffoli gate to actually implement the bit and phase flip error correction code. And then I thought I'd give a little bit of an outlook about where we see superconducting qubits going in the next couple of years. So I, uh, there are a lot of different kinds of superconducting qubits. The kind that we use at Yale are called transmons, which are sort of the maximally simple version of a superconducting qubit. Um, in fact, it's, you can just think of it as an LC oscillator. Uh, but since that's a harmonic thing, it's not a very good qubit. Uh, so we add a nonlinear element, the Joseph's injunction, to make the inductor nonlinear. And so uh, you, have, uh, you have many excited states, but the, the, there's an anharmonicity between the transition between the zero and first and the, uh, and the second and, uh, first and second state. So we can use the, the ground state and the first excited state as our qubit. Here's a picture of one. It's kind of uh, 300 microns long, so if it's, it's just barely big enough to see with your naked eye if you know where to look. Um, this sort of Bullwinkle structure, this interdigitated structure, is the, is the capacitance. <laughs> And uh, if we zoom in here, we can see that this is the inductor. We have a, uh, what's called a split Joseph's injunction. So um, you can sort of think of this as one junction that's sort of distributed so that we can thread flux through it so we can change the frequency of the qubit with an applied magnetic field. Uh, so we use, this, uh, we use these transmons in what we call CQD. It's not cavity quantum electrodynamics, which I'm sure you've heard of, where we have uh, very high Q mirrors and we shoot uh, atoms through them. Uh, instead, we, we use what's called circuit quantum electrodynamics, uh, which is sort of an analogy to this idea, where uh, we actually have a, a microwave resonator that's patterned on a two-dimensional, uh, where you can have a standing wave uh, mode between two uh, breaks in the wire, which, can, which are sort of analogous to mirrors. Uh, then we can stick some qubits in here and couple to the electric field. Uh, this cavity uh, does many, serves many functions uh, in our experiment. I'll list a few of them here. Uh, one of them is just uh, protected from spontaneous emission from the Purcell effect. Uh, if we didn't uh, filter out the modes that the, that the qubit could see, the, the lifetime of our qubits would be on the order of tens of nanoseconds. Uh, and if we do the engineering properly with our cavity, then the Purcell effect isn't a problem at all. Like, there, there's, there is no Purcell effect. Uh, we can put many qubits in a single, in a single resonator, and uh, we can multiplex the single qubit drives, so we can have a single port to drive many qubits uh, using frequency multiplexing, which is very nice. Um, we can through sort of the, the second order interact interaction of the, the qubit to the cavity, the cavity to the qubit, we can do two qubit gates, which I'll, I'll talk about in a moment. And we can qubit readout through, through, the, through the cavity by just basically measuring the transmission through the cavity and inferring what the state of the qubits are. Now, there are a lot of uh, theorists in the audience, so I'd probably get in trouble if I didn't have at least one equation. So this is the Hamiltonian of our system. Uh, it's called the James Cummings Hamiltonian. It's, uh, it's sort of you, you have a, a harmonic oscillator a spin, and then a coupling between them that allows exchange of interactions, or excitations. So here's that Hamiltonian again. And we can see uh, right away how we can actually do qubit readout with this, with this system. Uh, if we work in what's called the dispersive limit, um, where the, the frequency transition uh, of the qubit and the resonator are very different from each other, we can rewrite this Hamiltonian in an approximate way, where we no longer have this interaction term, but instead uh, there's an effective uh, sort of a dielectric that the cavity sees, where the, the frequency of the cavity depends on the state of the qubit. Uh, and so that's underlined there. So if we, uh, here's some experimental data showing the transmission through the cavity when the qubit's in the ground state. And if I were to do a pi pulse and do the same experiment, I'll get something like this, 
where you see the, the primary transmission has, has shifted quite a bit in frequency. Uh, and we, there's, still some, there's still some transmission here when we created the excited state just because the qubit has a chance to decay during this measurement. So if you imagine that we send in a tone at this frequency and we get a relatively high transmission, we can infer that the qubit's in the excited state. And uh, if we get a relatively low transmission, the ground state. I said that backwards. Um, it turns out that uh, this is actually very nice. This is, this is all sort of an argument for one qubit, but if you put many qubits in a single cavity, the measurement operator becomes something very useful, which is it answers the question, are all the qubits in the ground state? Uh, and it turns out that this, this measurement operator contains many, basically all the Pauli correlations, the products of I's and Z's. So you can do state tomography very efficiently. So the device I'm going to be talking about uh, is, uh, it looks like this. It has four transmog qubits coupled to a single resonator. So you can kind of barely see in that there's a break in this, in this center wiggly, wiggly wire here and here, which are the mirrors, They're the coupling capacitors of our, of our resonator. Uh, and then we have three qubits. Actually, in this picture, the qubits weren't patterned yet, but I swear they were there eventually. Um, and we have them at six, seven, and eight gigahertz, and then a fourth one up at high frequency, in, at, which we don't use in this experiment. Um, each, each qubit has these guys, these are called flux bias lines, which allow us to send a, send a voltage uh, down to, to very close to the qubit and, and run a current, which changes the magnetic field seen by the qubit. And we can use that to uh, move the qubits very rapidly. In fact, in, in nanoseconds, we can move them by many gigahertz. And this is actually how we do two qubit gates. So the, the kind of two qubit gates that we, that we use in our system are, are phase gates in the sense that they never cause changes in the excitation of the system, but rather they, they cause uh, various phase evolutions for the, for the different computational states. Uh, so in this notation, the ground state will go to itself. Uh, the excited state of, the, say, this top is perhaps at 9 gigahertz uh, goes to itself, but plus a phase. Uh, how do we get this phase? It's actually very simple. Um, if, we, if we imagine that we move this qubit down for some period of time uh, and then back up, the, this phase will be basically the integrated detuning as a function of time relative to this phase reference, which is a, a microwave generator in the lab. Uh, you can imagine that the other qubit, we would have the exact same, the exact analogous phase. Uh, but if we talk about the, the one one state, it's going to suffer both of these phases because it has, it has uh, both of these qubits excited. But it'll have a very special phase called, that we call the two qubit phase, which is associated with entanglement. And how do we, how do we cause this entanglement? This seems like a rather exotic thing. Um, well, it relies on the fact, at least in, in our implementation, that our qubit isn't really a qubit, but it's really a nonlinear LC oscillator. So it has a higher excited state. So if we, if we do this experiment where we're moving this, this top qubit down in frequency, the 1-1 one, one state will go down at the same slope as this one, but the 0-2 state will keep our slope, and there will be an avoided crossing between the two. So if we imagine, if we imagine uh, going down this line adiabatically, you'll see that our, the slope of our line is going to change relative to what it would have been if this avoided crossing worked here. And we'll have this parameter zeta, which is associated with, with the rate that we're acquiring two qubit phase. And if we make this two qubit phase, if we, if we do our excursion properly, this two qubit phase will give us a two pi, uh, which, will, which we can then use to make a conditional phase gate, where all the states except for the one one state map to itself, but the one one state maps to minus itself. So that's one way of doing it. That's the adiabatic way. And now I'm going to talk to you about a, a sort of a, a similar idea, but it's using the maximally different approach, which is we're going to use a, a similar avoided crossing in a, in a sudden way. So, if we move our 1-1 one, one state into resonance as quickly as we can into 0-2, then we will no longer be in an eigenstate of the system. We're sudden. The, the wave function hasn't had a chance to evolve. Instead, we're going to be in a superposition of the symmetric and anti-symmetric combinations of the avoided crossing. Uh, since, these two, since these two states don't have the same energy, they're going to acquire phase relative to each other. And if we wait the exact right amount of time, meaning a full oscillation to 0-2 and back to 1-1, one, one, we're going to have a minus sign. And so this is a, an exactly equivalent way of making a C phase gate. It's, it turns out to be about three times faster, though. And here's some data characterizing this avoided crossing. Uh, so what we do is we move in for some period of time to some uh, frequency location. Uh, basically, you can think of this axis as applied magne magnetic flux. Uh, and we oscillate between the bright state is, is 0, 2, and the dark is 1, 1. So we're going to oscillate between these two states. Uh, and if we wait until we, we do a full oscillation but come back to our original state, this is exactly where we want to be to have our C phase gate. And that happens in about 12 nanoseconds. I'd also like to point out at this point that waiting 12 nanoseconds, we waited 6 nanoseconds 
we could very efficiently transfer from 1, 1 into 0, 2. And that's going to be important later on. So how can we use these gates to do interesting things? I mentioned before that the sample that we're talking about has three qubits. So this is, say this blue qubit's at 8 gigahertz, 7, and 6. So let's say we can make a bell state between the, the, top, the, the top two frequencies. Uh, so we can just put the two, two qubits on the equator, do one of these C phase gates, uh, where this notation just means which phase, uh, which state requires our, our minus one phase. And then do, a, do, a, do a, a final rotation and do state tomography. I'm not going to explain how we do state tomography, but it basically relies on the fact that this measurement operator is this nice thing that contains all these three qubit correlations. So here is some experimental data. This is uh, basically a, a nice way of visualizing the three qubit density matrix, where we plot the, the poly operators for all the, all the different poly operators. In this case, there are 63 of them. Um, so this is sort of the single qubit uh, poly oper operators. So this, the first qubit, the second qubit, and third qubit. And then we have two qubit correlations and three qubit correlations. And we can immediately see, we can actually just read off the fact that this, 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 qubit, this, uh, this red qubit isn't entangled with anything because it has an individual character. It knows which directions it's pointing. But these two qubits are entangled with each other. They don't know where they're pointing. But if you ask them in a very particular way, if you ask about two qubit correlations, it does have an answer. So you can, you can immediately read off from this plot that we have a bell state in, in two qubits. And we can also talk about the, the fidelity of this operation, which is sort of 94, 95 percent. Uh, we, can, we can follow the logical uh, extension of this and make a, a three qubit entangled state just by involving this last qubit by uh, uh, doing a C phase on it as well, and make what's called a GHC state, where it's, it's the maximally entangled state of three qubits. Either they're all in the ground state or all in the excited state. And again, we can, we can visualize the density matrix to see that all three qubits are entangled. They don't have any particular characteristic them, such strong two and three qubit correlations. And again, we can talk about the fidelity by just taking a dot product of this, and we get about 90%. So uh, GHC states, as I'm sure uh, everyone knows, are very interesting because they have this property that all the two, Z, all the two qubit ZZ correlations have the value plus one. Uh, and in fact, a, a more general version of this, uh, alpha 0, 0, 0 plus beta 1, 1, 1, also has that property. And importantly, it doesn't, by, by measuring these ZZ correlations, you don't learn anything about alpha and beta. This is obviously a stabilizer state. So if we, if we encode some information in this, in this, in this uh, form, and then we allow a single, a single one of our qubits to be flipped, uh, we'll, we'll have, uh, if we measure the ZZ correlations, we will have a unique uh, mapping of uh, what error has happened. And so this is the basis of the idea behind the bit flip code, as I'm sure everyone knows. Uh, so I'll just step through this very quickly. Uh, this is actually the measurement-free version. And we also are going to be disencoding bits. So this is not anywhere close to being fault tolerant, but it's something we can do. Um, so if we, if we have some state alpha 0 plus beta 1, uh, we can do this encoding that I talked about, where we can uh, create this, this nice state. Then say we allow a bit flip happen, to happen on this middle qubit. Uh, we'll, our state will evolve to this. If we disencode it and also decode the information, uh, now the state is, has uh, suffered a bit flip, but our ancilla qubits uh, are in 1, 1, which indicates the middle, middle qubit has been flipped. And then if we, if we do this, this last little bit, which is a, a controlled, controlled knot, basically it'll flip the middle qubit if and only if this qubit and this qubit are excited. But in, the, in this case, both qubits are excited, so it'll flip. Then we'll get our state back, and the ancillas will be in some state which uh, we can reset through some process. But this is, actually, uh, this is actually a tall order. This gate right here is actually very difficult. Uh, it's called a, a Toffoli or a controlled controlled knot gate. And uh, if you were to build it out of two qubit gates, you kind of need five of them, which is a lot. So uh, is there a better way to do this, is the question. And of course, I wouldn't have, answer, uh, I wouldn't have asked you that if the answer wasn't yes. So how do we make a better uh, Toffoli gate? Uh, well, so I already introduced how we do two qubit gates. It sort of works on the, based on the fact that the 1, 1 state is the only computational state that can access the second excited state of one qubit. So we might expect that we can make a three qubit gate in analogy by having the, the, the excited state of all three qubits talk to the third excited state of one qubit. Unfortunately, it's not quite that simple, although that is the essence of the gate. The reason it's not quite that simple is because these two states don't talk to each other. They don't have an avoided crossing in some sense. Uh, so instead, we have to transfer the quantum population of 1, 1, 1 into a state that talks to 0, 0, 3, and, and namely 1, 0, 2. Uh, and then there's an avoided crossing between these two. Excuse me. So how do we do that, uh, how do we do that exchange? 
Uh, what I have here plotted is a numerical diagonalization of the, of the, Ham of the system Hamiltonian with, with three qubits. And here's some data, some uh, time domain data characterizing this. This is, again, we move to a certain flux location and wait for a certain amount of time, and we see oscillations between the two states. So if we can, if we, so what we're going to do is we're going to move, move suddenly into this location. We're going to wait exactly half a rotation and then, move sudden, and then move suddenly further up in frequency. And you'll, you'll notice this is actually the exact same trajectory we would take if we followed this avoided crossing adiabatically. It's just this is a lot faster. It's, it's instead of taking about 100 nanoseconds to do this transfer and back, it takes more like uh, 14 nanoseconds, which means it'll be a higher fidelity operation. Uh, then once we uh, are in this state, this 102 state, uh, we can now access this 003 state. Again, there are going to be a lot of, uh, in, the, in gray here, we have a lot of states that are uh, nearly degenerate with the states that we're talking about. Most of them don't matter because there's no matrix element to couple the states that are populated. So this looks like kind of a mess, and it is, but it's not nearly as bad as you might think. Uh, so what we can do is, again, we have some time domain data characterizing this avoided crossing. So we create this 102 state and then move up uh, as a function of, of, of flex bias and wait for a certain amount of time. And we can see that this, this very rapid oscillation is the avoided crossing we're interested in. So we're going to approach this avoided crossing adiabatically because it's so fast we can't be sudden to it. And again, this line will diverge from the, the slope that it would have had if this avoided crossing weren't here. And this will give us our three qubit phase. So there's, there's obviously a lot of technical details to get this gate right, but, and I'll, I'll spare you them. But uh, let's just talk about how do, we, how do we prove that this gate is actually doing what we think it is. Um, and the first thing that we can do is just measure the classical action of the gate. Unfortunately, this is a phase gate, and classical bits don't have phases. So uh, we have to dress it up to make a, a controlled, controlled knot. Uh, and so what we're going to do with controlled, controlled knot, uh, we're going to put in a basis state, in, in this case, eight basis states that span the computational space. We're going to apply the gate to them and then do state tomography on the output. And so that's what's plotted here. I have some input state, some classical input state. I take its, uh, the dot product with the classical output state and, and, and have the, the, the result plotted here. Um, the, the, in almost all cases, nothing happens. Uh, like 111 goes to 111 almost all the time. Uh, but the, the two states, 101 and 111, are flipped, as they should be, because we have the, the first and third bits are our control bits. So we'll flip the middle qubit if and only if the two, those, those two outer bits are excited. And so we can, we can assign a fidelity to this. In this case, it's 86%. But this isn't, uh, this isn't the conference about uh, classical error correction. We really want to know the action of this gate on quantum objects, namely the, uh, the action on superpositions. So we're going to do the same thing. We're going to, we're going to create some state, act the, the operator, and do state tomography on it. But uh, we have to do 64 basis states, because that, that'll span the full Hilbert space of our computational basis. Uh, and then as uh, Ramon uh, mentioned, we can, we can convert this, uh, these, these series of measurements into a chi matrix. And here's what that chi matrix would look like. It's, in general, it's a, it's a complex matrix. So I'm, I'm actually plotting the absolute value of chi here. Um, and there's some sort of uh, order of operations here that's not very interesting, but you have to know in order to interpret this matrix. But this is what it should look like, uh, and this is what it does. Uh, this is experimental data, and it's, uh, you know, it's reminiscent. It's sort of, you can see that that's kind of what's going on. Uh, you can take the dot product of these two matrices. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is actually a, a series of 4,000 measurements. It kind of takes 90 minutes, so it's, it's kind of, you should be impressed that I can, you know, measure this. <laughs> um, and again, we can assign a fidelity to this case, and it's, it's uh, 77%. So if you, if you lost me during that gate explanation, I don't, I don't blame you, but here's a, here's a good time to tune back in. Uh, gate to actually do quantum error correction now. So again, uh, we have this, this gate circuit, uh, but in, in the experiment I'm going to show you on the next slide, uh, what we're doing is we're creating some state, in this case the, the plus x state. Uh, we're applying some deterministic rotation on one of the qubits, uh, and then we're going to measure the state fidelity of this middle qubit, uh, and compare it to the state that we created. So uh, I'll first show what, ha what happens if we don't do error correction. Or will I? Here we go. Um, this is the case of no error correction. So if we, if we don't have an error, meaning a zero rotation, uh, we sort of get the maximal fidelity. But if we do a full pi pulse, then we're going to be nearly orthogonal to that state. But if we do error correction, uh, it's, it's going to wiggle a little bit because the, everything has finite fidelity, but uh, you can clearly th see that the amplitude of this oscillation is a lot smaller. Um, also, since we have three qubits now, we need to make sure that all three are robust to errors. So we can do bit flips on the other two qubits and see that they all behave rather nicely. 
So, so that's, uh, that's a nice result, but it's sort of a null result. We do something and nothing really happens. So how, how can we build up some confidence that we actually understand what's going on? Um, so we can do that by actually looking at the, looking at the two qubit density matrix of, this, of these ancilla qubits, this, this junk as I label. Um, and uh, we can, it's particularly easy to understand this after a full bit flip. So these, these, these two qubits should be in, uh, in a computational product state. So if there's no error, uh, we should be in the ground state as we are, uh, and so on. And, and we see that uh, in, in all these cases, we're, we're there, you know, we're always with some finite fidelity, but we're almost always in pretty much the state that we should be in. And you can also see very, very easily here the fact that we, use, we need two full qubits to encode the error syndrome is, is why we need at least three. Okay, well, so this isn't a very, um, this isn't a very accurate model. This error model of having a single on, on one qubit at a time isn't a very accurate model of what we might actually have in a, in a real uh, quantum computer. So let's instead uh, talk about uh, having simultaneous errors on all three qubits with some probability. So uh, in this case, I'm actually going to do phase flip error correction just for kicks because it's, you know, it's pretty much the same. It's just a, it's just a matter of uh, single qubit rotations to do, uh, to, to turn the phase uh, flip code into the, into the bit flip code and, and vice versa. Um, and what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be doing Z gates on all three qubits of some known rotation. Uh, and if I, do, if I do rotations on all three qubits, we actually have some probability of having uh, two or three errors which are uncorrectable by this code. This code can only deal with a single error at a time. So uh, I'm actually going to do something a little bit fancier. I'm going to be doing, instead of just state tomography, I'm going to be doing process tomography of the state. So I'll be creating four, uh, four input states uh, to span the, the one qubit basis. Uh, and here's the result if we don't do error correction. Uh, you see that uh, all the states go down linearly with this error probability. Uh, one of them doesn't care because it's an eigenstate of the, of the rotation operator. Uh, but if we do error correction, we see that, again, we have one state that's flat, but the other two states uh, are nice and curvy. They're, they're quadratic in error, in error probability, as they should be. And we can process this data to talk about, instead, the, the, the process fidelity of the, of, the, of the process and see that, in one case, we have a linear, uh, in, in the case of no error correction, we have a linear dependence on this phase probability. And in the other case, we have a quadratic dependence. And there's also, you know, there's some residual uh, linear dependence that's sort of consistent with zero. It's sort of, as uh, Ramon mentioned, it's 0 0.03 plus or minus 0 0.06. Uh, so it's, it's, it's hard to say exactly how much uh, residual uh, first, order coupling, uh, first order sensitivity we have, but uh, it's, it's largely quadratic. Uh, so what conclusions can we draw from this? Um, we've demonstrated the, the simplest version of the, the, bit, the uh, quantum error correction. Um, both bit and phase flip. Obviously not fault tolerant because we're using gates instead of measurements and we're also unencoding the, the process during the, we're also unencoding the, the qubit during this process. Um, it's, it's based on a, three, a new three qubit phase gate which uh, accesses the, the third excited state of a qubit. Uh, and there's a preprint available if, if you're interested. So I'd like to mention a few things about where we see superconducting qubits going in, in the future. Um, so we've demonstrated both bit and phase flip corrections and so we could concatenate those to make full error correction. Uh, and maybe maybe we could we could think about having a having a nine qubits or six qubits or seven qubits in a in a single resonator and making a logical qubit in a resonator and then coupling uh, those those logical qubits to each other. But uh, really, we we already know that the the qubits that I used in this in this uh, in this experiment aren't aren't good enough. They're not nearly coherent enough. Um, but fortunately, we've made a lot of progress on that front in a in a parallel experiment where instead of having a a, a planar uh, superconducting uh, device. We actually have a qubit and in dimensional box. Um, and this is sort of a cartoon of that. And it turns out for, for various reasons, uh, the, the three-dimensional architecture has about 40 times longer coherence time than, than the two-dimensional architecture. And so uh, part of the reason this works so well is because we, took all, we basically took everything out of the box that wasn't either a superconductor or made out of sapphire, uh, which, which sort of reduced our, the, the, our ability to control the system. But now, now we think we know how to reintegrate some of those, some of those uh, some of those knobs, like the flex bias lines and so on, uh, and also maybe a, a reset architecture and things, uh, so we could so we could uh, get the the capability of, of the four qubit device that I already explained, but with the coherence time of this of this uh, new uh, qubit. Uh, and actually, this this appeared yesterday in PRL, and PRL has a, a viewpoint titled uh, "Superconducting Qubits Are Getting Serious," which I hope you all agree with. Uh, and I'd be happy to take your questions now. So two talks in a row with the same three dimensions is better than two dimensions. <laughs> uh, questions? 
strictly speaking, you don't need measurements to do fault-tolerant quantum computing, except right. obviously for the readout at the end. But uh, you do need to be able to, say, refresh or reset mm -hmm, your mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, ancilla qubits. Or, or, or coupled to new ones. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any uh, way of doing that in your system, potentially? Yeah, uh, absolutely. There, there, are, there are a couple of ways that we've, we've actually demonstrated experiments where you can reset qubits with, uh, very quickly. Um, sort of the, the easiest way to think about doing that is to have the cavity itself be very low Q. So if you just bring the qubit into resonance with the cavity, it'll swap its excitation in and, and leave very quickly. Um, there's also other ways that you can think about doing that. Um, you can do sort of two qubit uh, or sideband gates where you, you swap the excitation of the, of the qubit again into the cavity. Uh, we've also sort of thought about more exotic ways of maybe we could reset the qubit through the flux itself. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is definitely a capability that we are aware we need. We are aware that we need, and, and we have some ideas about how to do it. Have you uh, quantified to what extent the leakage errors that you get when you couple to the, the 102 states and the, uh, the 003 states affects your? Mm -hmm. Error correction fidelity. Uh -huh. um, that's that's a it's a little bit difficult to be quantitative about that because we need to we would we would need to do sort of state tomography on uh, a manifold uh, a much larger Hilbert space. Uh, but what I can say is that we know that those those the population left behind in those non computational states has to be rather small uh, because uh, it would show up in a very uh, obvious way in the way we do state tomography. Um, the fact that I, I didn't show them in this in this. Uh, in this talk, but if we look at the raw data that went into that chi matrix, uh, there's a very there's a very obvious signature of, of leaving the computational state if you if you look at those if you look at those uh, those data. Uh, oh, lots of hands. Oh, so you go uh, through the trouble of creating a Toffel gate to avoid measurements. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it appears to me that measurements on the syndrome qubits would also affect your data qubits, and that's why you avoid them, I believe. So what's the future? I mean, can you, in the future, can you incorporate measurements in your error correction procedure or in your circuits, or is this incompatible with your architecture? Uh, yeah, th that's a really good question. So um, the the, yeah, you're, you're, you're right. The, the reason that we sort of are avoiding measurements in this, in this guy is, for one, we're having a single cavity, so if we measure it, then we'll measure all three qubits, and, which is undesirable. The other reason is sort of a more technical one, which is until very recently, the, the single qubit readout fidelity of our system is rather low. It's either rather low or it completely scrambles the qubits. You can have high fidelity, but you scramble the qubits, or you can have low fidelity, but you're, you're low fidelity. Um, it, but uh, fortunately, there's been a lot of progress made in that in, in sort of the last year where we can have uh, using very uh, very special microwave amplifiers, uh, we can have very high fidelity and also Q and D readout. And so we can we can actually think about having the ancilla qubits coupled to more than one resonator. So we have a central resonator for coupling the qubits, and then uh, ancillary resonators for measuring a single qubit at a time. And that, that's that's definitely something uh, that we're that we're thinking about doing. That that we could be, build that capability for with uh, fairly straightforwardly. So you implement phase gates using an anti-crossing uh, by two extreme approaches. Either you do it very fast, uh, if you can, do it faster than the, uh, is required, or you do adiabatically. Mm -hmm. In principle, you seem to know your Hamiltonians. You could find maybe an optimal solution in the middle and use coherent control. Did, did you think about that? Yeah, um, so yeah, using Landau zener tunneling. Uh, that is definitely something that we've thought about doing. Um, in practice, it's sort of more trouble than it's worth because we can make these very we can we can make these very um, these, these very nice sudden gates. So not only are they, they rather fast, so that they have high fidelity, but they are also very easy to tune up experimentally. Um, the problem with a, sort of a Lando Zener approach is that you sort of have a, a continuum of, of parameters to tune, and it's difficult to think of a sort of a straightforward experiment to, to find the, the, the optimal solution. I mean, yeah, we, that, that is true that we know the Hamiltonian very well, and. Uh, the, the fact that, for example, this, this, this three qubit spaghetti mess that I showed is actually com uh, exactly compatible with the measurement that we see. Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's, it's very sensitive to, to, to knowing our, our system parameters very accurately. And in, in practice, we just have to have experiments to, to tune it up uh, to that last few digits. Well, in the time it took Matt to give his 30 minute talk, he could have been performing 1,300 poly correlation <laughs> measurements. 
You better get back to New Haven. Yeah, the qubits are going <laughs> wild back there. All right, thanks to a highly disciplined performance by the session chair. We're only five minutes behind schedule. <laughs> if we, as we come back in 20 minutes, 20 minutes, right? So that would be 10.55, okay? Thank you.